we say shalom. Shalom. I'll teach you first a little bit of Hebrew. We say boker tov. Can you try to say it with me? Boker tov. That means good morning to all of you. I think there's something of great symbolism that I'm, I'm here today. Today represent the first night on sundown of the Feast of Tabernacle. And it's interesting, interestingly enough, it says in Zechariah that, that the Messiah that when I will reign in Jerusalem, Zechariah 14, in Jerusalem in the Feast of Tabernacle and all the nations will come and, and they celebrate the Feast of Tabernacle. And here I am with you guys today in the Feast of Tabernacle, so I'm, I'm rejoicing in this day. Now I'm going to need two brave volunteers. Uh, I'm I kind of going to change course a little bit here. I need two brave volunteers who wear glasses. Okay. You and you, come on. Give them a hand. They don't know what they're up to. <laughs> what is your name? Deanna, Deanna and? Bri Bryce? Bryce, come here. Can you hand me your glasses? Deanna, can you hand me yours? Here you go. That's your new pair. <laughs> here you go. That's your new pair. Sorry, Bryce. <laughs> Tell me, how do you see now? <laughs> hey. Hey, hey, can you walk straight? How is it going? Whoa, whoa. I can't see a thing. Okay, you can't see a thing. Well, give them a hand for a moment. The issue. Thank you. Better? Yes. Yes. Good. The, the issue of Jesus, or what we call him in Hebrew, Yeshua, is an issue of a vision and perspective, a first and foremost. I want to. <clears throat> Start with a little story, and, and maybe I should take a moment and explain to you what the organization that I uh, represent does. I founded an organization called Avata Mitz, an organization that deal with Jewish outreach, Jewish evangelism, reaching the Jewish people uh, with the good news of Messiah. Okay, and when we read the New Testament, we see something interesting. We read that in the Book of Acts, in the 21 chapter, it states that it says. Paul is coming back from all of his, you know, uh, he was an emissary. He's coming back to Jerusalem, and he's telling James and Peter, he's telling them how many people, how many Jewish people had come to Messiah, and they're all zealous for the Torah, zealous for the law, okay? There's been a, a era in the first century, as your pastor explained, uh, during, uh, before 70 AD, where the Jewish people were coming, uh, not... Not in hundreds or not in thousands, in tens of thousands to Messiah. Most of the estimates the, during, during the time of Yeshua, there were 150,000 Jewish people living, inhabitants in Jerusalem. 30,000 of them were Messianic Jews, or Nazarene, Messianic Jews. So can you imagine being in downtown Jerusalem and have one out of every five Jews believe that Yeshua, Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, yet live a Jewish lifestyle. So that is an amazing statistic to think about. Yet today, if you mention the name of Yeshua or Jesus, something, uh, uh, it's like a plague. It's a plague to the Jewish people. Something has gone wrong in the last 2,000 years that made this name very, very offensive to the Jewish people. Well, what is it that this went wrong? Just a little bit briefly about history. One of the major events that took place is uh, Bar Kokhva revolt took place. It was a great, great revolt where the Messianic Jews were part of the regular synagogues, okay? And in this particular event, a great rabbi by the name of Rabbi Akiva stood up and he declared the military leader, his name was Bar Kokhva, to be the Messiah of Israel. Well, what do you think the Messianic Jews have done during this time? They said, well, we're sorry. We cannot really take part of the revolt because our Messiah has already arrived. And because of this year event, the separation has started right there between the Messianic Jews and what I would call normative Judaism. Well, let, later on, if you want to go, and please receive everything that I say to you today uh, with an open heart, okay? Uh, we had later on, 325 AD, we had what's called the Council of Nasea where the day of worship has changed from Saturday to Sunday, and you start to see the separation between what I would call Christianity to normative Judaism, okay? The idea here is today, 
I will share with you a personal story. The first time I came to a Messianic Jewish synagogue, okay, it was so weird. The thing was just flat out weird. First of all, when I walked in there, <clears throat> I said, what are those people doing washing windows? They were doing this. You know, they're doing that. Are they washing windows? What is going on with those people? Like, I, I never see people pray like that. It, it's, it's a method. The, the, the difference is more, much more than just if Yeshua, Jesus, is the Messiah. It's a method of, of prayer and expression of the faith. The second thing that was weird, they were shouting a name that I, I, I the name Yeshua. Yeshua is a deriv, de, derived from the Hebrew word Joshua. You know, it's the same word as Joshua. Okay? And specifically, I thought they were, why are they praising Joshua? He was a great military leader. What, what's up with that? And then I understood they're talking about Yeshua. Well, guess what? And I, I want to give you one, one word of encouragement in this. Uh, it was the, the leader who gave me a New Testament that I put next to the dirty socks and underwear for five years before I, I dared to open it. And what I found in this particular book when I read in the Hebrew, I found everything about the New Testament to be Jewish. The people are Jews, they live as Jews, okay, and they also observe Judaism as the first century Judaism, okay. Unfortunately, there is a big separation that the Jewish people must be made, and I know it's, it, I'm, I'm going to try to say it in a very sensitive way, so, so everybody hear the heart of what I'm trying to say. Uh, I thought, you know, raised in Israel, uh, born and raised in Israel, I never met a Gentile till I was 18, 18 years old. And then when somebody said to me, Jesus Christ, I saw there's a somebody, his first name was Jesus, and his last name was Christ. So this was weird to me, you know. Uh, today, uh, unfortunately, uh, Christianity, uh, it's very hard for the Jewish people to see Jesus as the Jewish Messiah, because Christians, for the most part today, do not resemble anything that can be Jewish. Uh, I, I mean, and, and I'm not saying it to be a negative here or, 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 or anything. Jesus was a Jew. He lived his life as a Jew. He, he did everything, you know. It says he, he celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles and, and Pesach and not Christmas and Easter. So for a Jewish person, when you say, well, uh, Jesus, Jesus, the, the Jewish Messiah, you say, well, how can it be? Because the evidence of the church, because of the 2,000 years of separation, has become so broad away from Judaism. Now, so what, what is the, the story here? You know, I, I got to share, and I'm not even using my presentation today. I hope those stories will resonate in your mind today. Um, I was recently, how many of you like music here? How many of you like the Beatles, the greatest band ever, right? <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, well, as I share with you, what our organization does, we must reconcile Jesus, Yeshua, to Judaism. When we do that, then the discussion about the validity of the New Testament becomes much more clear. We have to, to have some, we have to show Jesus as a Jew, first and foremost, you know. Don't tell a Jew to become a Christian or become a complete Jew. That's not going to go very well. Just don't use the kind of terminology. Terminology is key. So when I was in the local synagogue here, you know, kind of like Apostle Paul walking to the synagogue, I walked into the little, little synagogue here in Fort Worth, and the rabbi came and asked me this question. He says, eh, so you are the rabbi of the Messianic group. I had every Messianic group, Jew that I know come to their services. We outnumbered them in their own building. Isn't that a beautiful thing? But uh, we came for a Holocaust memorial service. And he asked me, do you like music? And I said, of course I love music. Who doesn't like music? I say, you guys are like the Beatles. I said, what do you mean? He said, the Beatles have this great song. And he pulled out his iPhone. And he played me the song called Twist and Shout. <laughs> and he said, you are twisting the truth. And then you shout it in our face. And therefore, we will never accept this man. We will never accept him because you are forsaking Judaism. So, in essence, I want to explain to you that this is a very difficult problem. You know, the one thing to deal, you know, with Islam and atheism and so forth, but the New Testament tells us in Romans chapter 9 that the Jewish people are the rightful owners 
of the covenants of God. You realize it, that even the, 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 the new covenant was coming first to the Jewish people? When Yeshua was walking on earth, he said, do not go to the Samaritan the first time. You know, so go to the Jewish people. And then upon his return, he said, now you go and share the gospel with, with, with everybody, with everybody. So there is this issue here. And, and I want to explain to you, to think that the Jewish people do not know what Isaiah 53 says, Isaiah 9, Daniel 9, you know, Isaiah 7, it's foolish. The Jewish people know the Hebrew Bible better than the, than the Christians because it was given unto them. So that is not the issue. There are two issues here. You remember the example I gave with the glasses? Number one, knowing how to read the Bible in its proper context is key when sharing the good news with the Jewish people. I will give you an example and maybe that will resonate for you. Uh, from the New Testament, believe it or not. Because I think the reconciliation that must take place is between the New Testament as being a Jewish book to the Jewish Messiah. And most importantly for us is how do we manifest ourselves, not as Jews, you know, not necessarily as Jews if you're not Jewish, but show uh, uh, attributes that no, will not be foreign to a Jewish person. Okay? Um, Yeshua said this, he said, I am the way, I'm the truth and now the life. How many of you know what this, the read the district? Now we read this statement, it's mean, it's mean, you know, he's the way, truth, and life. That's one way to read the statement. But the Jewish people have four layers of reading the Hebrew Bible. One way is just reading the text for what it's mean. The second layer of reading the, the Bible, it's called in Hebrew remazim or clues. You're looking at hidden meaning behind the text. Okay? The third layer is through sermons. You know, Judaism is filled with 3,000 years of sermons. The Talmud is all what it is. It's a sermons about, about the Word of God. And the fourth layer is what we call the secrets of the Torah. You see, the, the, the Bible, when you read the Bible, you read it in English, right? Most of us read it in English or Spanish or, or something. We read a translation, in essence, translation to the original. The Hebrew language is like a multidimensional language. Every Hebrew letter, as an example, has a numerical value that made up our words. I'll give, you an ex I'll give you an example. How many of you think a snake is a bad thing? A serpent in the Bible is a bad thing, right? Do you know that... In the Hebrew Bible, uh, in the New Testament, Yeshua says he doesn't need to be raised up like a serpent, right? The serpent in, in, in the desert, you remember when the children of Israel look at the serpent? Why would Yeshua say that? For Jewish persons, it's made very clear. The value for the word serpent in Hebrew is the value of 358. The value for the word Messiah in Hebrew is also 358. In essence, Yeshua declared himself to be the Messiah. Or when we read in the New Testament, you know, it says that we're in 14 generations, 14 generations, 14 generations. What's up with that in the book of Matthew when we read about 14 generations? Why? Well, the word 14 in Hebrew means David, David, David. It's repeat. For the Jewish people, it's resonate. They understand what it means. Matthew wrote, according to Jerome, the church father, was written in Hebrew. Now, do we have the... the, the uh, the manuscript, maybe the Catholic Church have it, but we don't have it. But the Jewish people understand what this means. Messiah, son of David, Messiah, son of David, Messiah, son of David. Or when Yeshua say, I'm the way, the truth of the life. Way, truth, and life. It's an acronym in Hebrew that every Jew know what it means. I am the one. The word way, truth, and life, the one, is also the same word for the word love in Hebrew language. In essence, what Yeshua is saying, I am the Lord of love. I am the one. I'm the one you've been waiting for. You see, so we don't think about those things, but for the Jewish eyes, unless you have the proper tools to explain it, it's become very, very challenging. Now, we looked uh, very carefully you know, a, a moment ago at the history of Judaism, right, from uh, 70 AD all the way to, to today. It's important to understand that Judaism, just like Christianity, has been progressive, the Judaism that is exercised today has nothing to do with the Judaism of the 21st uh, uh, Today, they have nothing to do with the Judaism that Yeshua exercised. I want to read you a real quick quote. And this has come from the Talmud. You might, some of you ne might have never heard anything about the Talmud. And that's maybe explain to you how Judaism uh, is, uh, is it's changed. It says this. 
Um, just one second. I want to be accurate when I read it. I tell you what, I will not read it. I'll just tell you what it says. Okay? <laughs> Make it really quick. Here's what it says. It says that during the time after 70 AD when the temple was destructed, the Jewish people, you know, the, the, the foundation of Judaism is what? Deuteronomy 6, 4. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Now, people, people think that this is something that Yeshua made, made up in Mark 12, 28, 29. But not. Yeshua is quoting the Torah. He's quoting Deuteronomy 6, 4. Here is Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. It's the foundation of Judaism. It says that after the death and the resurrection of Messiah, the Jewish people in the temple court, actually before 70 AD, stop saying this specific prayer on the temples. And then it's explained why they stop saying this particular prayer of the fear of the followers of the Nazarenes. You see, Judaism in essence became a reactive. And why it has become reactive? Let's not say, oh, bad, bad Jews. It's become reactive. It became reactive because the persecutions by those who said they are Christians, and we know they are not Christians, sadly. Do you know, as an example, that all the way up to the ninth century, how many of you know Isaiah 53? The suffering servant, you know, the famous. Up to the ninth century, every Jew in the world believed that Isaiah 52, speaking of the Messiah. But because of the persecution during the Middle Ages and the need to separate Judaism from Christianity, the Jewish people said, no, no, it cannot speak about the Messiah because that's what the Christians believe. It must be speaking about Israel who will suffer. You see, so I want to give you the, this picture that Judaism itself is dynamic. Now, I deal a lot with anti-missionary organizations. Those organizations are bringing Jews who accept Messiah, and they try to have them to renounce Messiah. This is, this is, this is some of the groups that, um, that I'm dealing with. I want to read you. This is not fairy tale. This is real. This is a debate that we had very publicly with one of the leaders of the group in New York City. Okay? And here is what he wrote me back. Listen to that. This is the heart of the issue. You know all the issues we talked about? There's one more issue. The issue is not the validity of the New Testament per se. Per se. That's a, a byproduct of the issue. The issue had to deal with the deity of the Messiah. That is the core issue. Jewish people can believe that Jesus was a, a rabbi, was a good man. That is not the issue. Here is what he said. He, he said that in order to establish his relationship with the Jewish people, God instructed himself to the nation as a whole with the words, I am the Lord your God. Exodus 20, verse 2. This revelation gave the people to, gave the people to understand that there is no other power from God as it's quoted in Deuteronomy 4.35. I'm the Lord your God. I'm alone, the Lord your God. This revelation was God's way of teaching us whom to worship. And through the process of elimination, who we cannot worship. If the being in question was not present at Sinai, in essence, if he wasn't in Sinai, he does not deserve the devotion. In essence... The issue of following of Messiah is an issue of idolatry for the Jewish people. Here's the way he concluded it. And he said this. He said, this is one of my peers, Dr. Michael Brown. Here's the response they wrote to Dr. Michael Brown. He said, Dr. Michael Brown would have us believe that idolatry is limited to obstinance to statues. This is not true. Worship of anyone other than God who revealed himself at Sinai is idolatry. In, in any case, Brown himself advocates, in theory, worship of a physical body. Brown, along all the Trinitarian, brackets, Christians, claims that while Jesus was alive, he ought to have been worshipped. In other words, while Jesus wa was alive, Christianity would have it ad adherent pro protesting themselves in adoration and worship of a human. This too is a blatant idolatry. And you know what? They are absolutely right. If we worship 
Jesus, Yeshua is a man, we ourselves broke the word of the Torah. Now you have to understand something. We have, it was funny, I was in a Christian church and, and they have the, the Bible and they have the yellow pages and the white pages. The white pages was the New Testament, the yellow pages were the, and the pastor said, turn to the yellow pages. And the guy next to me says, well, we hardly ever go to the yellow pages of the book. The point is this. The New Testament cannot stand by itself without the foundation of the book, which is Torah. Yeshua quoted from the Torah more than any other thing. The Torah is the first five books of Moses. So the challenge here is reconciling Jesus, Yeshua, not just the Messiah. That is not the problem. But it's the issue of the deity of the Messiah. How we, we, we were, if you said to a Jewish person those words, Jesus is God, okay? Or we are to worship Jesus. You, by default, already have no opening to share the good news with him at this point. The issue of reconciliation is a key. You see, we present the same, pro, the same things to the Jewish people, but we present them in a way that they can understand it. I will give you one example, and maybe I conclude in this. It says, Jesus is God. Let's take the big one for a moment. You realize that in the, book, the New Testament itself, a Jewish book, they came to Yeshua, and they gave him the same accusation. They say, Yeshua, how dare you to make yourself God? How dare you? Have you ever took the time to read Yeshua's answer to the Hebrew, Hebrew mind? Because he quoted the Psalms. And here it was, was Yeshua's answer to them. And he says, and Yeshua turned to them and he said to them, Why are you calling me God? You are God, or in Hebrew, Elohim. You are Elohim. Why are you blaming me of being Elohim? You are Elohim. Now, for you in English minds, it's probably saying, oh my gosh. What am I saying? I'm saying I'm like God? Well, no, this is not exactly what I'm saying. Yeshua is saying that in essence we all have a particle in us that is, that is part of the Lord. And we all have this ultimate, ultimate capability that it says in Psalm 8 to create slightly below him, to do great, great things. Yeshua said the issue is not if I'm God. The issue, the way you present the gospel, is not to say Yeshua is God. It's you speak instead of the authority of the Messiah. You see how I speak about exactly the same thing, but I do not use a, a, a language that is very coarse to the Jewish person. Jewish people, if you say a person is God, you lost it. But if you talk about attributes of the Messiah, now you can open the, open the door to speak about this. I will close with this. This is very, very lasting. Uh, several, several years ago, I met a, a man, an uh, Orthodox Chabad, uh, Chabad rabbi in Israel. His name is Ariel, and Ariel came to the, to the knowledge of Messiah. And he was a great, great Hasidic rabbi who lived in Jerusalem. He is the chief musician in Chabad house. Wonderful, wonderful uh, keyboardist. And as we start talking together about the Messiah, as, as, as he's a messianic believer, and so I, I find out that we are argue more than we agree. And I said, wait a second. Wait a second. We are both following of Messiah. How can we argue on so many things? And he said, here's the difference. I am, uh, I am still, I don't like even the term Messianic Jew because all of Judaism is Messianic. And for me, it's more important, it's something to think about and pray about. For me, it's more important to be in a framework. For the Christians, it's always about being right or being wrong. But this is not the way Jews work. Jews much rather die in their own framework, in their own community, than being right or wrong individually. Okay? It, this concept of individual salvation is something very, very foreign to the Jewish people. That is one of the big differences. Israel never think about it, their individual salvation. We talk about corporal salvation of all of Israel. Okay, so one of the things that I encourage, of course, there, we know the truth, okay, but we have to think as Jews to understand it. And one of the things that brought me to the Lord was a book that was written in the 19th century by Rabbi Lichtenstein. And here's what he said on his dying bed, and I'll close and conclude with that. He said that he asked that this, this is a great, great rabbi who came to the knowledge of Yeshua, and he asked, Write this on my gravestone. Here rest 
the great, the, he rests the, the disciple of Yeshua of Nazareth, a member of his community. The day before he died, they asked him, are you sure, Rabbi, you don't want to change it to say a member of his church? And he says, no, no, I don't want it to say a member of his church. I want it to say a member of Ecclesia, of his community. Ecclesia is a Jewish crowd. I often, and then he concluded this on his dying bed, and he said, I often vision myself walking among Simon Peter, Paul, John, and James Yaakov. This is the first community. This is the first Messianic synagogue. And this is the community that I am a member of. Okay? I know it is difficult for us to understand it. But Yeshua is coming back to Israel. That the church is part of Israel now. You've been grafted in. It's Roman 11. You've been grafted in. And, and, and Israel is made out of Jews and Gentiles together now. And, and I, I think part of this restoration that the, the pastor is talking about has to be, unfortunately, have to be in the fact that the church itself needs to become, I'm not talking about Judaizing. But it has to become something that the Jewish people can recognize as something authentic uh, as related to the Jewish Messiah. So thank you very, very much. Thank you. <laughs>